Hello and welcome to Better Man Clinics, the podcast where we talk to actual experts to address the questions the men want answered but are either too embarrassed to ask or simply don't know who to ask. Before we get started, I do want to caution that the conversations on this podcast are for informational purposes only. They don't represent a medical consultation, nor do they present medical advice to individuals. Rather, we hope that the podcast empowers men with the knowledge and confidence to address these issues with their healthcare providers. As with any medical or wellness issues, you should always consult with your healthcare provider before beginning any type of treatment or preventative intervention. With that being said, in this episode, we discuss anxiety. Now, over the past few years, we've all experienced our share of anxiety. Stress can be a natural part of our lives as a response to events that occur in relation to our jobs, our families, or our health. But what happens when stress transforms from a nuisance to a debilitating condition that impacts all aspects of our lives? How do we even know if we have a problem with anxiety? Are there ways to restructure our lives and our lifestyles to better handle stress? When should we seek professional help and what does that help actually entail? And what is the right balance between success and the stress that inevitably comes with it? To answer these questions and many more, we are fortunate to be joined by Dr. Demetrio Satiris. Dr. Satiris is a practicing board-certified psychiatrist specializing in the field of anxiety management. He is a clinical assistant professor of psychiatry at Northeast Ohio Medical University. He studies and writes about the interface between, uh, between anxiety and achievement. His popular Psychology Today blog, called Anxiety and High Achievers, is viewed by more than 20,000 readers every month. He has given a TED Talk on the subject as well, titled Why Success Will Make You Happy. His writings have appeared in Psychology Today, Psych Central, NAMI, Thrive Global, Kevin MD, and The White Coat Investor, among other publications. And now, Without further ado, I bring you our conversation with Dr. Demetrio Satiris about managing anxiety. Hello and welcome to A Better Man Clinics. Today we're going to be talking about anxiety, an issue that more and more of, of us have gotten uh, accustomed to, especially in the last uh, couple of years. Now, we all experience some level of stress in our lives, whether that comes from the job, our family, health issues, or different uh, life experiences. But when does that stress become more than just a nuisance? When does it become a life-altering problem? And when is stress not stress, but an actual anxiety problem or disorder? And if we feel like we have a problem with anxiety, how do we address it? Can we do anything in our daily lives to limit it? Uh, can we change the way we behave or what we do, who we interact with, even what we eat? And is there a point where we have to be honest with ourselves and say, we've done all we can, and now we have to get help? And what happens then? In order to help us answer these questions and many more, we're very uh, lucky to be joined by a true expert in the field of anxiety. Dr. Demetrios Satiris is not only a board certified and licensed psychiatrist, he's also actually an expert and specialist in the field of managing anxiety. Dr. Satiris, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. I'm truly uh, grateful to have the opportunity to uh, join you for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. I know, I know in my practice, I hear more and more uh, from uh, the guys that I take care of about stress and anxiety, really playing a much bigger and bigger role uh, in guys' lives. So I know there's a lot of people that are really interested to hear your thoughts. Uh, before we dive into the topic at hand, I, I know that our viewers and listeners always like to get to know uh, our guest a little bit better. And, uh, you know, obviously psychology and psychiatry are really fascinating fields, the field of the mind and emotions and how your brain interacts with, with your environment and really constructs the world around you. What really uh, inspired you to go into the field of psychiatry and specifically to focus also with the specialization in anxiety? Absolutely. Great question. So, um, um, you know, when I was uh, younger, um, we had a, a loss in our family. Um, a cousin of mine passed away um, when I was a uh, freshman at college. He was a senior in high school. 
And that really got me um, into uh, medicine to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, that's when I realized the importance of uh, health. But then uh, once I was in uh, med school, I realized that I cared more about one's emotional health. I was fascinated in learning about one's story and what uh, predisposes one's, one to difficulties and listening to stories in which people find a way to overcome challenges and difficulties, right? And overcoming the odds. So um, because of that, I went down the road of uh, psychiatry, uh, which is a, a field of medicine in which we focus more on one's uh, mental health. That's interesting. And, and what about anxiety interested you? Like, I know you do a lot of work in that field. What specifically interested you in that? Yeah, it is so, so prevalent, number one. I mean, it is impossible to avoid, right? Like when we look at the data, 30% of U.S. Um, adults will have an anxiety disorder at some point in their lives. So you really... Uh, want to have at least a, an understanding of anxiety because you will encounter it in any uh, field of medicine. Uh, but number two, um, personally, I, I had some difficulties with anxiety in, in my past. You know, I remember when I was younger, you know, I would be, for example, obsessed with getting good grades into um, to get into med school and, you know, getting a uh, a subpar grade would create this catastrophic thought process in me, right? As if like the world was ending and, right. you know, I would be very irritable as a kid, right? So, um, so some personal experience with anxiety at a younger age, but also it's so prevalent and there's such a huge need that it's something that I really do focus on when it comes to taking care of my patients. Got it. Got it. Well, that sounds fantastic. I know you you have a passion for it, and so I, I think it's uh, it, it's going to be really interesting to discuss. Um, you know, we're gonna as, as one of my classmates in medical school uh, used to say, I'd like to start off with just the basics. So you know, it's going to be sound like a silly question, but let's for the purposes of this discussion, how do we define anxiety? And what I mean by that is. Everybody understands I'm stressed out, I feel stressed, you know, I had a rough day. But when do we actually start calling this anxiety from, from your perspective as, a, as someone who treats it? Yeah, so anxiety is that feeling of dread that we get in anticipation of something. It's that feeling that you get in your stomach, for example, when, you know, before you have a job interview, uh, before you have to take an exam, you know, before you even ask someone out, someone on a date, right? So it occurs in anticipation as we look into the future. Um, a little side note here. I, I think there's a negative connotation associated with anxiety. I think a lot of people are afraid to admit that they have anxiety as if it's a weakness. And I think when people say that they're stressed or they're irritable, um, it's language that what they're really saying is that they're anxious, but they're afraid to, to admit that they're anxious. Mm -hmm. So um, I think anxiety is a lot more prevalent if, if we, than, than we realized. But at the same time, there's a negative connotation to it. And I think people, a lot of people try to hide their anxiety. That, that makes a lot of sense. And to that point, so, you know, you had mentioned, um, you know, growing up and medical school and stress, you know, dealing with the stress of a test or whatnot. Now, when I was growing up, I always heard the mantra that, listen, a little bit of stress is good, right? You know, you, it keeps you on your toes. You're, you're not kind of just blasé about everything. You know, you're, you're, uh, the stress is, is getting you uh, to succeed. So where, and I don't know if this is an easy question to answer, where do we draw the line between what I'm going to put in, in quotations as normal stress or maybe even good stress and something that becomes pathological or an anxiety disorder that really does need to be addressed? Yeah. So what I tell people is to experience anxieties to be human. Like when we look at the human brain, its function from an evolutionary standpoint, the function of the brain is not to make us happy. The function of the brain is to help us survive. Like when we think about what the world must have been like five or 10,000 years ago, you know, our ancestors would go hunting and, you know, they'd have to worry about falling victim to, you know, a cheetah lurking behind a bush or a gator yeah. lurking under the water. So our environment has changed rapidly, 
even during our lifetime, but evolution happens at a snail's pace. So to some degree, to have anxiety is to be human, and we need some anxiety to motivate us, to keep us on edge, to keep us vigilant. Um, the problem is when anxiety becomes excessive for the individual, and it affects their day-to-day -day function. That's when we have an anxiety disorder. Examples would be if someone has such anxiety that they can't sleep, they can't turn their mind off, um, or if somebody has such in levels of anxiety that they're afraid to leave the house, they're unable to go to work, they're unable to socialize, um, or when they're having anxiety to the, the degree that it's creating physical symptoms that are debilitating. Um, anxiety is associated with a host of physical symptoms. Mm -hmm. And I can describe some of those now, such as perhaps like heart racing or shortness of breath or upset stomach or being shaky or sweaty or dizzy or lightheaded, right? And when, you know, these symptoms can affect day-to-day -day functioning. Mm -hmm. So when you're having these physical symptoms or when you're having anxiety that's affecting your ability to function, uh, that's when it's crossed the line to it being an anxiety disorder. Great. That's a great way to think about it. Like, again, we think about good anxiety as kind of keeping you on your toes and leading you to success versus bad anxiety, which is actually becoming an impediment uh, where it's a, actually starting to affect your life. Um, and a follow-up question to that is, so again, we think about anxiety, it, quote unquote, it's all in your head. Uh, it's, it's a mental thing. It's an emotional thing. But is there, given the fact that this, this is an evolutionary, if you will, protective mechanism, right? Is there like a biological or physiological basis of, of some chemicals or something that actually triggers this feeling of anxiety in you? Yeah. So if we take a step back, I, I like to think of anxiety as biopsychosocial that there are biological, psychological, and social forces that make us vulnerable to anxiety. Um, but if we focus on the one um, part of the uh, model of the biological component, uh, there are certain variables there. Uh, one example would be the HPA axis, the hypothalamic uh, pituitary adrenal axis. And, and long story short, we have this almond-shaped structure in our brain called the amygdala, Greek for almond. And uh, this plays a role in the, the formation and the storage of emotional memories. And it plays a huge role in our fear response. Um, in some animal studies, for example, they removed the amygdala and they found that the fear response was blunted. So this amygdala, it sends a signal to this HPA axis. Um, so it stimulates the hypothalamus to send a signal to the uh, anterior pituitary, to send a signal to uh, the uh, suprarenal gland, the adrenal gland. And ultimately, this entire axis produces cortisol. And the job, I mean, cortisol has a number of functions, one of which is uh, to have a bunch of sugar available in our bloodstream so that that can be readily available for like our muscles, right? Because mm -hmm. if you're dealing with a very stressful, anxious situation, I mean, you don't want, you know, you, I mean, you want your, 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 your muscles really ready to act, right? Yeah. And you need sugar available for that. So uh, that axis plays a role in the formation of anxiety, the HPA axis. Um, there are also neurotransmitters, chemicals that are believed that are implicated in um, anxiety. Uh, three are serotonin, uh, norepinephrine, and uh, GABA. Um, so these chemicals, you know, they, they're believed to play a role in um, the association with, with, with anxiety. Got it. No, that, that actually helps a lot. And it, it really... Uh, paints that picture of this as a holistic problem. It's not just, again, oh, well, I'm a little stressed. It really does have uh, downstream consequences. And I'm going to, I'll have some follow up questions for that in a minute. But just in terms of you, I know we've been changing, uh, going through a lot of changes uh, over the last couple of years for sure. You, as a practicing psychiatrist who really sees a lot of patients who have anxiety, where do you see the most of those triggers for that anxiety coming from? Is it from home? Is it from just the overall COVID stress, work, some combination? If you had to, if you had to kind of describe it, where do you see most of this coming from most commonly? Boy, there, there's a lot here. So I'd say that one is change. You know, human beings, we do not like change. We're creatures of habit. And the reason we don't like change is because it creates 
this sense that we lack control, it uh, increases our level of uncertainty. And we don't like uncertainty as human beings. So I would right. say we've been dealing with a lot of change last um couple of years with the pandemic, right? A lot of uncertainty. Like the question that I hear all the time is, when is this going to end? And there <laughs> appears to be no end in sight, right? Um, the other one is, you know, conflict. A lot of times conflict can be anxiety provoking. Um, for example, if somebody's having a conflict in, in their marriage, that can be very difficult. Um, if someone's having conflict with like a boss and they're fe that they feel like they're walking on eggshells, that can be very anxiety provoking. Um, the, the other one is when you feel like you're not safe. And I think that this pandemic has triggered for us feelings of insecurity. Like, you know, we, we leave the house and we're like walking on eggshells trying to dodge these air particles, making sure that we don't inhale COVID, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this feeling of insecurity it can fuel feelings of helplessness and powerlessness, which is anxiety provoking. So an example I like to give my patients is, you know, everyone talks about uncertainty and how that is anxiety provoking, but we forget to talk about feeling powerless, feeling helpless, feeling unsafe. The example that I give is if I'm outside my parking lot and a cheetah's running at me, there is no uncertainty. I am certain the cheetah will catch me and maul me. Yes, right? this is true. Stronger than me, <laughs> faster than me. So at this point, the variable that's producing anxiety is feeling powerless, feeling helpless, feeling unsafe. So mm -hmm. those are three variables that fuel anxiety, uncertainty, um, the change, and also feeling powerless, feeling helpless, uh, and then finally conflict. Got it. No, that, that, that definitely are some sources. Those are definitely some, some sources. Yeah. Have you seen an increase in terms of the number of people coming for anxiety given the last two years with COVID? Have you seen an upsurge of that? People yeah, needing there, help? There, there certainly, yeah, absolutely. There, there really has been, there, there really has been. Um, and, and that's been supported by, by the evidence out there that anxiety has been on the rise. It's been on the rise by the way, before the pandemic, but then mm -hmm. you throw in a pandemic and the rates have, have truly increased. Um, right now, I think people are struggling to figure out what to do with the holidays. You know, yes. do I go to that family event? Do I not go to that family event? So there's a lot of, again, anxiety over that. There's a lot of conflict. People are fighting over what to do within their households. You know, one partner may say, yeah, we're going to our aunt's, you know, Christmas Eve dinner. And the other partner say, hey, I don't feel safe going there, right? And mm -hmm. then there's like this, there's, there's this feeling of like, when is this ever going to end? You know, people are getting antsy. People are feeling anxiety because there's the uncertainty of there is no end in sight, right? We assume that with the vaccines that, okay, this is it. This is the finish line. We're rounding third and heading home. But now we're seeing that cases are going up and up. Hospitalization rates are increasing. And, um, People just don't know when it's going to end, and they're finding that very stressful, very anxiety-provoking. I can imagine. Now, when people think about anxiety, they, they think about it internally. How does it affect me? But anxiety is not uh, necessarily just affecting an individual, right? What, what role have you, what I, sh I should say domino effect have you seen in your practice where people come to you and say, listen, I have got anxiety in terms of how that impacts their family, their home, their loved ones. How does that, it, those feelings of anxiety translate into relationships outside of your own body and your own mind? Yeah. I mean, anxiety is contagious. You know, the example I like to tell people is that's, you know, was it March of 2020 when we were worried about running out of toilet paper because we were all like anxious about, you know, the pandemic and, you know, not having any toilet paper at home. Right. So anxiety is contagious and you can actually feel it in another person. Like when they have a significant increase in anxiety, they project that anxiety onto you. You feel that that's known as projective identification, like you feel their anxiety. And that can make you want to like back away from them, or that might irritate you and frustrate you. And then you might throw the anxiety back at the person, right? So anxiety certainly affects um, interpersonal relationships. Because it's very difficult to absorb someone's anxiety. It can be very overwhelming to know what to do when you have a loved one approach you 
uh, in an anxious state. Um, the other thing that sometimes people do with anxiety is the opposite where they like shut down. Um, the way that we respond to anxiety is flight, fight, or freeze. So one of the ways that we shut down, uh, I mean, think about again, evolution when animals play dead to avoid yeah. uh, falling victim to a predator. So people may isolate from their loved ones because they're overwhelmed and they're anxious and they're looking for some safety um, in isolation. So um, I would say these are some ways in which anxiety affects uh, our interactions with uh, people close to us. Sounds like a, like could be a pretty bad vicious cycle. You know, you're already starting off anxious and that's destroying relationships and isolating you, which could only, I'm sure, add to more anxiety. Um, to that same effect, internally, like we, we, you did a great job a few minutes ago, uh, painting the relationship between anxiety and kind of the internal systems that create it. But uh, anxiety can also, my understanding is, can also have significant actual impacts on your overall health in the same manner. Because you, you know, a lot of the symptoms you described, whether it be fast heart rate or sweating or gastrointestinal issues, I'm sure they don't go without uh, having their impact on your health overall. Is that correct? Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, if we take a step back, anxiety starts with a thought or a behavior, right, which we can talk about later, but then that fuels a cascade of physical symptoms. And, you know, if you're under a state of chronic stress, that is not good at all for one's physical health. Um, for example, 60% of people with an anxiety disorder, they suffer from some kind of GI, gastrointestinal uh, malfunction. For example, they may struggle with IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, anxiety disorders have also been found to be associated with cardiac uh, mortality right? It puts extra stress on the heart. They're associated with hypertension. Uh, they're associated with um, disruptions uh, to the, um, you know, endocrine and immune system, right? So um, we, we have this illusion that like mental health and physical health are, are separate as if mind and body are separate, uh, when in reality, they're interconnected. As I mentioned before, like the HPA axis is an example, you have this signal in the brain that goes all the way to your adrenal gland above your kidneys and the cortisol going from head to toe pumping in your bloodstream, right? So mental health conditions, these brain conditions, they can affect the rest of the body and they can have a significant adverse effects on our overall physical well-being. Yeah, yeah, it can be that could be pretty significant. Sixty percent of it with GI conditions. That sounds that's yeah. pretty stark. That's for sure. Yeah. Now I want to talk a little bit. Okay, let's say we've identified that you know we maybe we we haven't clinically diagnosed ourselves with an anxiety disorder, but we feel we we have more anxiety than we're used to dealing with. Right? Uh, there's different ways to approach that. And the way I want to start off with is some a guy as a lay person at home trying to say okay what what kind of things can I do without seeing a doctor to potentially on a generic level make things better now obviously this is going to be a big big caveat here everyone is different so triggers of anxiety are different it's a lot more complicated than you know take two of these and, and call me in the morning right mm -hmm. but if you're talking about diet and lifestyle and just the way you approach life are there some generic recommendations for guys who might be feeling more anxious to ways to kind of tone it down a little bit yeah um so, th so, th so the first thing i would take a step back and say the first thing it's important for us to be able to identify anxiety because mm -hmm. it comes in a lot of flavors a lot of different signs and symptoms mm -hmm. so for example you might be feeling you might be dealing with anxiety if you're more irritable than usual and having a hard time with dealing with frustrating events in your life or you know what if it's affecting your sleep you might be dealing with anxiety or if you're like on edge or a lot of muscle tension especially in the shoulders and the neck area because with anxiety we get the we tend to tense up right or anxiety is exhausting right you know so the first thing i would say is to work on developing insight and understanding oh, I'm anxious. Because a lot of people have anxiety, they don't even know that they're anxious. So right. with that in mind, I would say that um, a good technique is meditation. And there's different types. Mm -hmm. But from a, as far as a psychological intervention, med meditation helps us reduce anxiety. And the reason it does is because 
when we're anxious, we're looking into the future, we're worrying about the future. And meditation brings us back to the present. And the way to do that is to go to a quiet room for five minutes, quiet room, dim lights, and to focus on the quality of your breath and to focus on slowing down your breath. And I know that sounds so simple, but it is so hard to do to focus on the quality of your breath for any extended period of time because the job of your brain is to pump out thoughts, to pump out worry thoughts, to look for what can go wrong, to make you worry about dinner or the kids or what you have going on the next day. And at any time your brain starts to pump out a worry thought and you bring it back to the quality of your breath, that is the bicep curl. That exercise is observing yourself wandering away and bring yourself back to the present moment. That is a bicep curl. That exercise itself helps one develop insight, develop awareness, and to um, be more present, which is the antidote to anxiety. Anxiety is defined as not being present in the moment, right? So that is an example of a psychological intervention. Um, as far as a biological intervention, exercise, physical activity is key. It is paramount. Um, you know, when we, when we engage in physical activity, such as exercise, it changes the brain. It has positive effects on the brain. For example, there's a secretion of endorphins. Um, it uh, increases the size of the hippocampus. Like there's, there's positive changes to the, to the brain structure. But psychologically, what exercise does is a number of things. Number one, it's a healthy way to release stress. You know, when we have our stress from the day, it has to be released some way, somehow. And it, to, to be able to release that stress on an Olympic barbell or going out for a walk is a very healthy way to loosen the valve and let some of that anxiety pour out of your body. Another thing about exercise is that it helps us be present. Like when you are lifting or when you're running, you're present on the left, you're present on the run. Otherwise, you'll injure yourself. Like you can't be like, having your mind wander away when you're bench pressing, that is not safe. You want to be focused on the present moment, right? So physical activity is very beneficial for anxiety. Studies have shown that. Not to mention that physical activity also creates a sense of empowerment, right? Anytime you're able to lift an extra five pounds or you're able to like jog an extra half a mile, you feel good about yourself. You feel empowerment which helps cope with anxiety. Um, as far as a social intervention, again, anxiety is biopsychosocial. I would say to be able to tell someone that you're feeling stressed, that you're feeling anxious. I think the worst thing we can do with anxiety is to bottle it inside. Um, that only fuels the anxiety. Like thought suppression is not effective. But to be able to tell your partner, you know what? I've had a really bad day at work and I'm super anxious because I'm worried about a difficult case that I had, or I'm worried about our kids and to just be able to say that to someone um, and for them to validate, to acknowledge, not to criticize, that is extremely therapeutic, right? To just be able Absolutely. to get something off your chest. Yeah. So that, those are some, some, uh, tips that I would tell people as far as anxiety management. Did you have any questions on those or any thoughts about them? Well, it was uh, one thing I found very interesting is again, between the meditation and the exercise, uh, it sounds like, you know, usually when people think about anxiety, they want to get their minds off of things, right? Uh, but really what you're saying is you want to hyper-focus your mind on something else and to prevent the kind of stream of thought of anxious thoughts kind of uncontrolled running through your head uh, versus having going back and actually like in the in the most definitive way possible controlling exactly what you're thinking about and preventing uh, those those anxious anxiety provoking thoughts uh, to come through. Which leads to my next question, actually, which is kind of interesting. So like when most people, like you watch the movies, right? And you go, oh, I'm so stressed out. Oh man, I need a drink. 
or I need to have, I need to have a smoke or something along those lines, right? Where it's like that has been traditionally culturally, right? Like if you're having a hard day or you feel really stressed, those kind of uh, escapes are are the solution to anxiety. Where it's a very different process. That in that situation, you're almost losing more control versus kind of controlling your thoughts. What are your thoughts on that? And to what extent, I mean, not that not the, a doctor is ever gonna be a, a public service announcement for smoking or alcohol, uh, for sure. But what are your, what is the role, positive or negative, of like uh, um, alcohol or smoking in the, in the world of anxiety? Yeah, that plays a huge role. So a lot of the healthy techniques that I described, exercise, meditation, communicating with a loved one, they take effort. They're hard, right? It ta- it's hard work to go f- for a walk. It's, it's hard work to, to meditate. You know, there's a launch that's required and it can take a little bit of time before you feel the benefits. So in general, healthy habits, they take a little more work and it takes a little longer to notice the benefit. Some of these unhealthy habits that you just mentioned, like smoking cigarettes or drinking alcohol, they alleviate anxiety quick, but they come at a huge cost. They come with a lot of baggage down the road. So, I mean, we're all really aware of the negative effects of smoking, right? Mm -hmm. Um, As far as our physical health. But, you know, when it comes to smoking, it's not the nicotine that reduces anxiety. If it were nicotine, then I'd be putting nicotine patches on people. And it's not the tobacco and it's not the carcinogens in the cigarette. It's the... It's the deep breathing that people are doing. It's the oral fixation, you know? Mm -hmm. People are putting something in their mouth, which is a distraction. You know, they're using the cigarette to go outside and get some fresh air, right? They're engaging in deep breathing. They're maybe talking to someone else who's smoking a cigarette too. So it's not the actual cigarette, the chemical. It's what the chemical, what the cigarette is associated with. Hmm. that is really leading to the anxiety reduction. It's the deep breathing. It's the connection. It's the, I'm getting out of the office for five minutes and getting some fresh air. But we can do that without the nicotine, right? Right. Same thing with the alcohol, you know. Okay, so the alcohol, that's it's a little different. I stand corrected. The alcohol, it does hit a receptor in the brain, the GABA receptor, which is associated with anxiety reduction. That is true. The problem with alcohol, though, is Again, it can come with tremendous adverse physical health issues. Some are physical, like the liver effects, cardiac effects, weight gain, right? Excess calories. But also, it worsens anxiety in the long run. Because if you drink too much, yes, anxiety goes down. But then you're withdrawing from the chemical. And then eventually, anxiety goes on. And I've seen people who suffer from alcohol use disorder who are dependent on alcohol to manage their anxiety, and they become a a dog that's chasing its tail because mm-hmm. they drink to re- lower anxiety, but then they're withdrawing, and now they have to drink to deal with the withdrawal, right? So again, alcohol is a very dangerous substance to rely on to um, reduce anxiety. Yeah, and it, it, again, it just seems like the, the complete opposite versus the example of meditation or even exercise where it's very empowering and you very much have, you're taking control to some extent over your mind and body with alcohol uh, and just a, a, a smart smoking, you're, you're kind of relinquishing that control and hoping just to kind of, you know, quote unquote, be put out of your misery, but that comes with a big price. And uh, it's funny because I, I just had a discussion with uh, Dr. Tor Wager, who's a psychologist, folks uh, specializing in pain management, like psychotherapy for pain management. It was the same idea. It's the law of diminishing returns, right? You're going to, at first it's going to be, oh, wow, this really helps my anxiety, but then you need more and more of it to have less and less of an effect. And at the end of the day, if you don't actually maintain the control and take, take control of it, it's, it goes out of hand very quickly. Now, a few other kind of at home type of options for this that I wanted to just run by you. Uh, a lot of people, uh, purport like food diets uh, can have an impact on anxiety. Uh, I'm having my a hard time getting my head around that. I, it, like, you know, if I eat a carrot or a hamburger, is that going to make a difference? Is, does it? And, and to what extent? Yeah. Yeah. So there is um, a relative, 
excuse me, relatively younger field in psychiatry, nutritional psychiatry, which studies the impact of what we consume on our mental health. And here's a rule of thumb. If it's not good for your heart, it's probably not going to be good for your brain, right? As, as, a, as a general rule of thumb, you know, so if those French fries are not good for your heart or your liver, they're probably not going to be good. That inflammation associated with them is probably not going to be good for your uh, brain. Um, studies have shown that people with anxiety disorders have differences in their gut bacteria compared to the general population. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's not quite clear what came first, the chicken or the egg. Is it because they have an anxiety disorder that, that that's why they're having the gut bacteria or is it the gut bacteria that led to the, that predisposed them to the anxiety disorder? It's not quite clear, but certainly what we eat affects our health, uh, from head, from head to toe, literally speaking. Um, so yes, um, it is important when we, well, it is important in general for our physical and mental wellness to be very mindful of what we're consuming. Again, we don't have to be rigid. We don't have to be like strict, but just to be very mindful and to make wise choices, right? Um, it's probably help, better for us to eat some spinach than to like have those, have that hud fudge dairy, um, dairy queen Sunday, quite frankly, right? And just to be mindful of the choices that we are uh, engaging in as far as our physical and mental health. Yeah, that makes sense. I can't tell you how many times I've said what's good for your heart is good for your prostate. So why not good for your brain as well? Oh, it just man. seems to be the, the same offenders keep coming up over and over again. You know, just those French fries, they just they're just we're, I haven't found a good use case for them where they're really good for you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, just I'm still waiting for that, unfortunately. Yeah. And again, um, as Aristotle said, everything in moderation, again, again, moderation, being mindful, making wise choices and understanding how, you know, an unhealthy food can affect different organs in our body. Right, exactly right. Um, and to the same extent, just a quick question about caffeine. Um, so, you know, caffeine, you know, causes a lot, can cause a lot of the symptoms of anxiety, or, or I wouldn't say symptoms, but you know, it can make your heart race, can get, make you more on edge, right? Um, can, does caffeine or drinking a lot of caffeine, can that predispose you to, let's say, worsening situations with, um, uh, with uh, anxiety? Absolutely. Um, so when you, when you struggle with anxiety, you, you don't want to be adding uppers into your system and caffeine is stimulating, right? Um, so it can certainly exacerbate the physical symptoms of anxiety that you described, such as being shaky and being sweaty and having an increased heart rate. The other thing about caffeine to be mindful of is that it's got a half-life of, of, of about six hours. And what that means is that about half of that caffeine that you consumed six hours ago will still be in your body mm -hmm. six hours later. So that if you're consuming caffeine later in the afternoon or evenings, you're really stacking the odds against you of having a good night's sleep. Because right. again, caffeine is an upper. And when, when we have anxiety, we really want to make sure that the, our sleep is a uh, high quality so that we're getting the necessary rest to face the next day, because we don't want to get in that site that in that cycle where I'm battling anxiety and I'm up all night, stressing and worrying. And because I've been up all night, stressing and worrying, I'm tired. So now I'm consuming more caffeine to make it through the day, but I'm consuming it even later in the afternoon and evening. And now I'm not sleeping again. Right. So we don't want to get stuck in that cycle. So again, you want to be very mindful of what you're consuming. And that definitely includes caffeine. No, that makes sense. And then going back to the concept of, you know, isolation versus interaction, right? Now, for some people, their family is their source of stress. So that could be a, that could be a problem, whether it be difficult relationships or whatnot, for sure. But generally speaking, have you found that um, I, I know studies have shown that, like, for instance, with being able to interact more with friends and family can lead to more happiness. Have you found that that might be a prescription, if you will, for people with anxiety as well? Yeah, I, I think as human beings, you know, we all differ in our need for connection, how much we need it, but we all need it at the end of the day. You know, uh, we have a need for meaningful uh, interpersonal relationships and 
which we feel safe and we can trust the person. Um, but again, we differ in how much of that we need, right? Some people are content with seeing a loved one once a week, and some people need to have these interactions on a daily basis, right? Mm -hmm. But regardless, we need to be mindful and aware of where that line is. Because if you're an introvert, and you're interacting every every day with people, that's going to wear you out, and you're going to want to have some alone time to recharge your batteries. Just right. like the opposite is true. If you're an extrovert, and you're not interacting with people, you're really going to suffer. So I think the key is under being being self aware of like what your needs are, and making sure that your need for connection is being adequately um, met. Um, so, so hope that helps. That's a, that's a that's a really really good point uh, for sure. Now, moving on in terms of again, before we get to to the actual uh, healthcare professional uh, aspect of it, one other element I want to check is about support groups. Right? There's been, especially now with social media, there's been a ton uh, a ton of. Um, uh, groups out there, both like on Facebook or Twitter or, or a, a multitude of different uh, social media groups. Um, what is your thought on that? Do you find that that could be uh, beneficial or not really? You know, there, there, there can be benefit in um, knowing that you're not alone. Um, I think one of the worst things we can do is think that we're the only ones suffering. You know, um, the truth is that 30% of U.S. adults will have an anxiety disorder at some point in their lives. So knowing that you're not alone is reassuring, is, is comforting. At the same time, you know, you want to make sure that that group is led by somebody who's um, knowledgeable and knows what they're doing. I mean, it can devolve pretty quickly if you're having, you know, people just kind of dumping their anxiety one on the other, right? Right. Uh, that can be pretty overwhelming and uh, anxiety provoking in itself. So um, I think groups can be helpful uh, as long as they're being led uh, by someone, by, by, by a professional, you know, someone who's no, who knows what they're doing. Um, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then when, you know, when is it that time? So we've tried all these things and, you know, I'm still feeling a lot of stress. When is it time, do you think, to really seek help from an actual medical professional and to that extent, who do you seek help from? Is this your primary care doctor? Is this, do you go straight to a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a therapist? Or there's so many different options up there, uh, out there. Who, do, who does a guy turn to when they feel like, you know what? I just can't get control of this. Yeah. Uh, the first thing that I would say is the earlier, the better. Um, you know, if we look at physical health, you know, the longer you wait to, um, stabilize your diabetes or the or high blood pressure, the, the more work you, needs to be done. And the same concept is true for one's mental health, like the earlier, the better. And when it's affecting your functioning, you certainly need to seek medical assistance, like the, the, the help, the assistance of a medical professional, right? So again, um, not to belabor the point, but if it's affecting your day to day functioning, if you're not sleeping because of anxiety, if, you're, if it's affecting your ability to work, your ability to socialize, your interpersonal relationships, if you're having profound physical symptoms, even panic attacks, right? Um, these are examples when you've crossed the line into having an anxiety disorder and you really need to seek uh, help. But I would argue that just because you don't have an anxiety disorder and you have some underlying anxiety, it, it doesn't mean that you can't talk to someone, right? Because even lower levels of anxiety, you're not quite an anxiety disorder, but like high functioning anxiety is an example, that can affect functioning. That, that, I mean, that can affect the quality of your life. That can affect your ability to, to, to enjoy life and to reach your fullest potential, right? So um, just because you don't have an anxiety disorder, it doesn't mean that it's inappropriate for you to not speak with a professional, right? And to have a second pair of eyes and ears, you know, have a talk with you about your anxiety. Um, as far as where to start, um, you know, 
it can't hurt to start with your family doctor, your primary care physician, um, to have an annual preventative exam because there are physical conditions that can mimic or exacerbate and one's anxiety. So, you know, when you see your family doctor, your primary care physician, um, they will do a physical exam, they will order, order some blood work, right? And that's really helpful to make sure that there's nothing underlying physical that's fueling an anxiety. For example, if you have a thyroid abnormality, right, that can make one prone to anxiety. Um, if you're having electrolyte abnormalities, if you're having anemia, um, you know, maybe you're on a medication that is fueling anxiety, right? So, you know, starting with your PCP is, I think, very reasonable. Um, you know, if you're dealing with a stressor and you're having a hard time coping with that stressor, there's nothing wrong with, with reaching out to a psychologist, right? Um, to, you know, get something off your chest and to, you know, receive the opinion of a mental health provider, right? Um, same thing holds true with, with psychiatry. Um, I know psychiatry, we have the stigma of prescribing medications, but, you know, and not doing therapy. But personally, uh, I do both medication management and psychotherapy. There's plenty of my patients who I don't have on medications. We just do psychotherapy for an hour. Uh, and some people need, you know, medication management assistance, you know. Uh, so, you know, finding the right psychiatrist who's willing to, to, to do both, I can think can be helpful as well. So I think those are some places that one can reach out to. That makes a lot of sense. Now, one of the one of the main goals of, of these kind of conversations, I want guys to feel very comfortable with what they're signing up for, right? Mm -hmm. And most guys have gone to their primary care doctor, but most guys haven't gone to a you know behavioral health or a mental health professional, right? What do they expect if you know? If, let's say I went to my primary care doctor and they said, you know what, um, I, I want you to see Dr. Satiris. You, you know, I think you need a little bit more help than than maybe I, as a primary care doctor, can provide. What would, what would a guy expect walking into your office for that first evaluation or consultation? What should they expect uh, to experience during that visit? Yeah, great question. So um, if somebody were to see a mental health provider like a psychiatrist for the first time, uh, they would get a lot of questions about the anxiety, like um, how long have you had it? What are some things that trigger the anxiety? What are some things that make it better or worse, right? How's it affecting your day-to-day -day functioning, right? Um, they would get a lot of questions about other mental health conditions uh, because there could be some cor correlation between anxiety and depression or, you know, bipolar disorder, right? Or ADHD. So, you know, you may get questions about some other mental health conditions to make sure we're not missing anything else. Um, you would get questions about your medical history, um, because again, physical health conditions can mimic or exacerbate anxiety. Uh, you would be asked your list of medications because again, some medications can exacerbate anxiety uppers, for example, you would be asked about your, you know, substance use, uh, caffeine, uh, nicotine, uh, alcohol use, any, you know, other substances like cannabis, right. You know, any illicit substances, because again, these can affect our um, levels of anxiety. Uh, you would be asked about family history uh, because um, there is a strong genetic component with anxiety, but also if the family member's on a medication that helps them, that's very important for me to know, right? Because mm -hmm. that might be something that could be helpful for you hypothetically, right? So that would be something that, that I would wanna know. Um, uh, what else? Um, list of medications I would ask about. Any past psychiatric history? I think that'd be important to know. Um, and if you, you know, if you have a therapist, if you have, if you've been in therapy before, what are your expectations of therapy? Right. Um, so those are some of the questions that um, would pop up on the first evaluation. Again, typically the first session is not very therapeutic because the person's asking a lot of questions. The mental health provider is asking a lot of questions to try to have an idea and understanding of what the person's going through and how they can be helpful. Got it. And then you had mentioned, and sorry, I guess I'm having a little video issue there, but at least you can still hear me. Um, the You had mentioned that um, you, op therapy versus medications, right? Uh, you know, everyone uh, kind of hears about um, 
you know, uh, psychotherapy, but they're not quite sure what does that even mean. And I know I'm sure that could be an episode in and of itself. Uh, but what what does psych what is psychotherapy? Like, if you can sum it up in terms of like what's what's involved with that? Yeah, yeah. And there's different modalities and uh, types of psychotherapy, right? And um, I would say that one of the goals of psych psychotherapy is to help someone be more insightful to understand the thoughts and the behaviors that make them vulnerable to, to difficulties, right? Mm -hmm. um, and for that to happen in a very supportive and non-judgmental uh, environment, you know, because again, you, you, wanna, you wanna trust your therapist, you wanna trust your psychiatrist, you know, uh, you wanna say what you have to say and not worry about being judged. Um, mm -hmm. so, so I would summarize therapy as far as that. It's, the it's, it's a process in which we're trying to increase our level of self-awareness. So um, self-awareness of what's causing it and getting, how do you help us get control of it? Is it going back again to the meditation, to those kind of things? Is it going, is it overcoming the triggers or avoiding the triggers or I'm sure some combination thereof maybe? Yeah, yeah. So for example... A lot of times we, you know, we look at a situation a certain way. And mm -hmm. when the patient's describing to me, um, I tell them like, hey, have you, I hear what you're saying. And I understand what you're saying. And that makes a lot of sense to me. But have you considered looking at it five degrees this way, right? Have you considered this possibility instead of just what you're saying? So mm -hmm. uh, one of my goals in therapy is to help people understand the thoughts that make them vulnerable to depression, to anxiety, right? Um, because we engage in these thought patterns, they're known as quote, cognitive distortions, these thought patterns that make us vulnerable to anxiety. An example, for example, would be um, worst case scenario thinking, catastrophic thinking. You know, we treat a worry, for example, as imminent and inevitable, even if it has a low to minimal probability of occurrence. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, they might describe to me a, a worry and I might ask them, well, what, what are the odds? Like, how, how likely do you think this worry will become a reality? Mm -hmm. Because understanding the odds lowers anxiety, right? Like if, if, if your doctor tells you that you have a, um, a mass and there's a 90% risk of the mask being cancer, that is a lot more anxiety provoking and stressful than being told, yeah, 1% chance, you know, odds are overwhelmingly in your favor, right? So right. Like, one of the things that I want to do is I want people to understand their thought process. And I want them to um, be able to evaluate their thought process and even challenge these cognitive distortions, you know, like the worst case scenario thinking as an example. And other things that I want people to be mindful of their behaviors. A lot of times we engage in behaviors that make us more vulnerable to um, anxiety. An example would be people who have a hard time saying no. You know, mm -hmm. they say yes to everything that comes to them. They have a hard time setting boundaries and they end up spread too thin and overwhelmed. Right. And now they're dealing with work and family responsibilities and a bunch of social responsibilities. And they double book themselves because they were too afraid or too guilty to say no. Right. So mm -hmm. through therapy, understanding, you know, how the lack of proper boundary setting is fueling anxiety and learning how to set healthy boundaries. Right. Working on developing the tools and the skills to set boundaries right so again through that insight that process of insight hopefully we can then start to develop some tools to challenge thoughts and behaviors that make us vulnerable to anxiety but in addition to that again having the tools and the skills to manage the physical symptoms of anxiety you know for example if you're having a panic attack um well, what are things that we can do to lower to minimize the impact of the panic attack right you know, maybe working on our deep breathing skills so that we have some sense of control when panic strikes, right? Mm -hmm. um, because anxiety, if I, if I can take a step back, it has that thought component that I described, the worry thought, for example. It has the physical symptoms and it has the behavior component, right? So then like if you're going to be engaging in therapy, you want to have tools 
to regulate the thought, to regulate the physical symptoms, and to regulate the behavior. It has to be a holistic type of therapy that addresses all three uh, components of the anxiety. So that's, that's a good way of putting it. I mean, you're really providing them with a toolbox of ways to, you know, overcome this anxiety. Um, to that end, like is psychotherapy, should we think about this as a short-term kind of understand, uh, become aware, learn the tools, and then you're on your own? Or is psychotherapy more a long-term process where you're constantly refining and working on and, and overcoming new issues that might be provoking anxiety, for instance? How do you see psychotherapy either in the short or long term? Yeah, I think <laughs> it depends on the person, you know? Um, so for example, somebody may come to me dealing with a stressor, they're having a conflict with a spouse, for example, and you know, helping them navigate the conflict through a few sessions, maybe all they need uh, as far as going back out into the world, you know, and no longer being in, in, in therapy, right? right. Uh, but then there are some people who have chronic and long term difficulties with anxiety, and they need to engage in therapy every two weeks, every three weeks, every week to help them function optimally. You know, I think of therapy as, as a medication and, and it's about figuring out what's the proper dose of therapy by trying to figure out how often someone needs it. Like what's, what dose do they need? So some people might need it very short term uh, because they're anxious about a short term stressor. And once we overcome this stressor, they, they're, they're, they feel better. And then some people, they, they need the therapy like, like medicine every two weeks, every three weeks. And when and how does actual medication fit into this picture of treatment for anxiety? Yeah, yeah. Uh, a couple rules of thumb is that if, you know, you've engaged in therapy, but you're still having difficulties, um, that is a good indication that you might need some medication assistance. Um, another example is when you're having physical symptoms of anxiety that you're having a really hard time um, regulating Um despite being in therapy, you know, uh, you're not sleeping, you know, despite your best efforts, you know, and having a hard time focusing, you know, um, you you can't, um, control your mind despite your best efforts, like you're in therapy and you know, the cognitive distortion, but you still need some help. Right. So I would say those are situations where you might need a little more help in addition to the, uh, the therapy. And, the these medications, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of different kinds and, and is beyond the scope of this conversation. But on a high level, like what do these medications actually do to dampen your anxiety? Yeah. So the first line agents, they're known as SSRIs, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And long story short, they increase one's level of serotonin uh, mm -hmm. because low serotonin is believed to play a role in um, anxiety. And um, examples of these medicines, um, Zoloft, Prozac, Paxil, Lexapro, uh, Selexa, these are some medicines in that class. And long, you know, just they, they increase the level of serotonin. Um, people in general take these medications every day. In general, you know, you want to start a low dose and you want to slowly increase the medication to the dose that the person needs. Um, they can take a few weeks to kick in these medications. You know, they don't have an immediate effect. It takes some time to kick in. Um, they can have side effects like, like anything else out there, right? Tylenol can have side effects. Ibuprofen over the counter can have side effects. Too much water can have side effects. So, you know, potential side effects with these medications. Um, so they can lead to some upset stomach, right? Because they affect serotonin, but we have a lot of serotonin in our gut system. Um, uh, they, some people might experience headaches or some fatigue. Um, they talk about suicidal thoughts. So, you know, you want to make sure that, you know, these medications are prescribed by somebody who, you know, knows what they're, what they're doing. Right. Sure. And who knows the literature and how to prescribe them. Um, you know, they, if I gave you too much serotonin, you could have serotonin syndrome, for example, these are rare side effects that I'm talking about. But overall, again, these medications are overall, again, they're, they're, they're well tolerated overall. And uh, they, they, they help many people uh, with underlying anxiety. And there's other class of medications beyond that too. 
you know, with these medicines, similar question is, the, are these like, once you get go on them, is that kind of a lifetime thing like cholesterol or blood pressure medicine? Or is it sometimes they get you over the hump until psychotherapy can help you get where you need to be or some combination? How do you usually see that? Yeah, exactly. It depends on the person. So some people might be on these medicines, you know, three to six months, and then they get over the hump, and then they're doing well, and they don't need them again. And, and some people, it's like diabetes or high blood pressure where, you know, they need these medications chronically to, to help them function. So, so really, it depends on the, on the individual um, as far as them. Oh, by the way, one more side effect that I forgot to mention, and this affects you as a urologist, sexual side effects. I forgot to mention that. I'm sorry. Uh, oh. these, side of, these medications in men can re reduce sexual desire uh, or they can, um, they're associated with some difficulties with um, – um, orgasm in men. So that's important to be uh, mindful of. Yeah. In urology, we treat it in the opposite. We use it for that purpose to, to uh, fix premature ejaculation. So yeah. some guys are like, Hey, it's a fringe benefit. It's not a side effect. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a win-win. Um, now we, when you're, I, I want to just ask a question about expectations, right? So like when somebody comes to you with an anxiety problem, uh, I would assume most people aren't going to go from really anxious to absolutely no anxiety, right? What's, what's con in your mind, what do you consider a win in terms of improving anxiety on, on a reasonable expectation level? Yeah, my, my goal is progress, you know, my, my, you know, I think perfection is a dangerous standard, uh, because you really set yourself up for all or nothing. Um, which can predispose you to failure, right? Um, I think the goal is to understand what the person is going through, uh, to build a relationship, a trusting, supportive, uh, non-judgmental relationship, and to focus on making progress. Because quite frankly, you know, health is work, and it, it's a long-term work that we have to do. Like we always have to work on our physical health, and I think the same holds true for mental health too, right? Um, you know, I don't care if you have a six pack and you're, you know, a Greek God, you start eating McDonald's every day and uh, Dairy Queen every day and hot fudge Sundays and you're not exercising, your physical health will suffer ultimately. Um, and the same idea holds true for mental health and that, you know, it's the consistent practice of these tools and skills that is what ultimately leads to um, optimal results. Um, there's no there's no quick fix or magic pill. If you, if you guys find it, you let me know. Um, <laughs> I'm sure that would make you happy too. You know, it's that yeah. consistent practice that is what leads to the uh, longstanding results. Makes sense. So exit question for you. Now, usually what I do is, you know, I ask all my experts, you know, what's the secret to their success and, uh, you know, the, the secret to happiness, et cetera. But for you, I want to ask a, a slightly tw twist on that. I know you've done a lot of work on, uh, I guess, the mental state of highly successful people and the price they pay both with regards to happiness and to stress and anxiety. And I know, I know you just did even did a TED talk on that recently or a TEDx talk on that recently. Mm -hmm. What is that balance? How do you find that? Because everybody wants to be successful, right? And everybody knows that there's a price for entry there and a price to maintain your position there. Have you found that balance? What do you think is the secret to people, to the success of exceedingly successful people. Yeah, I think the key is to work on developing a healthy relationship with the pursuit of achievement with success. You know, I think we live in a society where success is idealized, it is glamorized. Um, you know, we assume that success equals happiness. And that is probably the greatest myth out there. Um, you know, physicians, we're, you know, in general successful, but 40% of us plus are suffering from burnout, right? And you see these numbers throughout the board and other, quote, successful professionals like lawyers and dentists, right? So I think what we want to do is, A, have realistic expectations of what comes with success, that just because I'm successful doesn't mean that I'm going to be happy. Number two, we don't want to make the mistake of tying our self-worth to success, you know, the example that I tell people is that, you know, my, my dad's a cook and my mom's a cashier at a grocery store and, you know, money was really tight growing up. I come from humble beginnings uh, through their love and support. I've become a physician 
And sure, I've achieved a greater level of professional success or wealth compared to my parents, but am I a more worthy human being? And the answer is no, absolutely not. Because, you know, our self-worth is derived from our humanity. It's an innate, essential, and an undeniable part of our humanity. Like you are worthy because you are human, not because you're successful. So I think what we need to do is, you know, challenge the myths associated with success and to have realistic expectations of what happens when we're successful. Because when you achieve success, you're just substituting one set of problems for another set of problems. You know, um, you know, just because you make it to the top of the mountain, it, it doesn't mean that it's always going to be sunny with clear blue skies. You know, right. there'll be plenty of overcast days with strong winds and heavy rains. You know, we've had rough days as physicians, right? The same, you know, holds true for CEOs of a company or, you know, um, lawyers or, you know, anybody else who's, quote, successful athletes, right? They suffer at higher rates as well. So I th- there's nothing wrong with the pursuit of success, by the way. I mean, if you want to be successful, go for it. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and there's benefits in achieving success and pursuing it. But just make sure that you have realistic expectations of what comes with success, both the positives and the negatives. And also do your best to a- find some happiness and satisfaction in the here and now on your journey towards your uh, goals. Such, such valid, uh, such great points for sure. You don't want to wake up, you know, 50 years down the road saying, keeping straying for that br- brass ring and saying, what have I done in the interim? Where have my life gone, exactly. right? Such an important point. But Dr. Sears, thank you so much uh, for your insights. I think this has been fantastic. I think it's going to been very helpful for a lot of guys struggling out there with either minor or very serious anxiety as well. And to uh, all of you viewers and listeners out there, uh, remember our mantra here at Better Man Clinics, your best life is a journey, not a destination, and use every single day to get just a little bit better. We'll see you all next time.